Welcome to Massey College. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers, and I'm the principal of Massey College. It's my great pleasure to have you here for a special uh, number of a new series that we've decided to put forward, a, s a series where I am in conversation with one of our incoming senior fellows. I'm wearing my mask. She's wearing her mask because uh, during COVID times, we have not been able to welcome our senior fellows in the usual way, which was to have them at a high table, to have them in a community setting. So I thought it would be interesting to have a few conversation with people. So we get to pretend that we are uh, sitting together uh, in the junior common room and having a conversation, which I hope everybody will enjoy. So today with me, I have Miriam Diamond, and she is a professor at U of T, and I'm greatly happy to have her with us. So uh, first of all, Deborah Sherrod Lawler uh, said great things about you, and we're so happy and so delighted that you've accepted to become a senior fellow at Massey College. And maybe just you can tell me a little bit about what do you do? <laughs> What's your work like? Let me start by saying just how really thrilled I am to be a senior fellow. I'm very grateful to Barb Sherwood, Sherwood Lawler for proposing my membership, my fellowship. I'm really just so thrilled to be here. The other thing is it's a good thing that our eyes are very expressive. <laughs> because if I weren't wearing a mask, you would just see a very broad smile, a smile of happiness and, and really of, of great joy and pleasure at being here. If I could just say the first time I actually was in Massey College was when um, Professor Ursula Franklin oh. invited me. She was a mentor of mine when I was in, uh, in my doctoral program. Well, that's one. So you got to know her uh, when you were doing your doctorate. So how did it go? <laughs> <laughs> Ursula Franklin just imbued in me a lifelong sense of compassion, of listening to stories, of telling stories, of motivating people, and just continuing to just continue and continue to work for the public good. But to remember to respond with compassion was Professor Franklin's you know, major gift to me. So how, so you went, you were doing your PhD at University of Toronto, in what field? I was in the Department of Zoology in the 1970s. And what an amazing time <laughs> to be here. In the department, mm -hmm. there was um, David Suzuki, although I think he had left already. Mm -hmm. Donald Chant, who went on to form Pollution Probe. Oh. Harold Harvey, who was like the major figure to identify acid rain mm -hmm. in Canada. Um, the, it, it just titans, <laughs> titans of um, Canadian um, environmental protection. Yes. And they started me on the road. Oh, excuse me, I must remember to say Doug Pimlot. What Doug, who is he? Well, Doug Pimlot uh, was sort of the father of the World Wildlife Fund. Oh, okay. So you're doing your my bachelor uh, with uh, and uh, okay, so that's in zoology. In zoology, yeah. And so then happened? I went to follow my passion, which was in, believe it or not, bird behavior. Yes. <laughs> and so I went to University of Alberta. Yeah. I went to the I went to the Arctic to study birds. Oh. And then so that was a great passion. So bird behavior is not very useful <laughs> as a career, but let me tell you how it is useful. Uh -huh because I studied hierarchies and pecking right. orders. Right. So then when I got to university administration. <laughs> you could recognize the birds. <laughs> and I could recognize the behaviors, the dominance behaviors, the submissive behaviors. It was wonderful. So realizing that bird behavior was probably not going to get me too far. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, um, I actually started an ill-fated PhD um, at McGill mm -hmm. with um, Professor Frank Riggler, who was the formative scientist in the first scientist in Canada to really understand the issue of um, 
the overabundance of nutrients in lakes. Yes. Um, and it was amazing to be able to work with him, but he, he passed away very early, very untimely. Um, so I did some work in yeah. subarctic Quebec. Yeah. But from there, I went to mining engineering. Terrific. I yeah. did a degree in mining engineering at yeah. a time when women were not allowed into the mines because mm -hmm. women were considered bad luck <laughs> and would cause rock bursts. Oh. <laughs> so Very so how, how could you be an engineer if you couldn't go in the mines then? Exactly. Yeah. yeah so. so then I, well, I, I had wanted to work on environmental Issue. problems in the mining industry. Mm -hmm. um, the mining industry won out. Um, not a good time for women in the mining industry in the in the 80s. Yeah. So then I um, made another kind of radical shift. Yeah. I was so um, privileged to be accepted as a doctoral student uh, by Professor Don Mackay in mm. the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry mm -hmm. here at University of Toronto and at that time had the uh, real delight of being able to meet and um, exchange ideas, well, learn from Professor That's Ursula Franklin. Right, yeah. And then, so you completed your PhD, and then uh, what happened then? I managed to get a position at <laughs> University of Toronto. <laughs> good, good. But it was going, I went from chemical engineering, I, I was actually the first faculty hire mm -hmm. in environmental sciences and studies. Oh. Interesting. So what's, what's the project that you're working on now? Well, so I, I look at sources. Yes. Um, where, can, where contaminants are coming from mm -hmm. and how they get into us and how they get into the environment. Mm -hmm. So I'm concerned about human health. I'm concerned about ecosystem health. Mm -hmm. But if I could just back up a little bit. Yes. Um, when I started my faculty position, I was doing uh, research in the Arctic on yeah. Arctic contaminants. Mm -hmm. So I did have that Arctic connection. Yeah. But I had a young family. Mm -hmm. I had two kids before tenure. Yeah. What a time it was. <laughs> I just want to tell you, my kids are fabulous. Yeah. They're but totally normal and doing mm -hmm. great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyways, yeah. so, um, but I realized that I could no longer travel to the Arctic okay. or do that work. Yeah. And I watched my kids mm -hmm. and I thought, what contaminants are they being exposed, exposed to, to in the sandbox? Yeah, yeah. So I did really quite a radical shift mm -hmm. to look at contaminants in the urban environment mm -hmm. and then to look at contaminants indoors. Yeah. So being a mom mm -hmm. has r really informed my science, the questions I ask, oh. the way I look at the world, yeah. and, and, and um, of course a continued responsibility well, that's fascinating. It's so interesting because I have to say uh, I'm a mother too, and I remember it did change my scholarship a little bit. You know, you you cannot uh, be immune to the, the all the struggles that you see uh, in, in 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 your own. The, my story is that I wrote when I had the first child. It was a bit of a uh, running everywhere. I wrote this article about the liability, I'm a lawyer, eh? I wrote the uh, liability of the mothers <laughs> for the misbehavior of their children. So <laughs> it was frightening me. And <laughs> so anyway, so here we are. Um, so you, you've been basically a, a scientist in the environmental field at uh, U of T for all this time. So now that your career is at a little bit the international level and knowing all the other fabulous scientists around the world that work in, in this field. What's the, what's the next challenge for your group in terms of the, what are the gaps in science that need to, to that still exist? It's not so much the gaps in science, <laughs> it's the gaps in, a, in moving the science into society. Right. Yeah. It's the same issue as climate, issue change. As climate change. change. The science is there. We don't need more science. Mm -hmm. We need application. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, requires societal change mm -hmm. and um, the, the wisdom to move forward and, frankly, the fortitude and the courage to, to so. move forward. So what would you like to see in terms of public policy change? Um, I, I've just been engaged with a group of international scientists um, 
with the project of discussing the planetary boundary oh. for chemical pollution. So mm -hmm. the planetary boundary is sort of a limit yeah. beyond which um, conditions irrevocably, irrevocably, you see I can't even say it behind the mask, yeah. irrevocably change, change. Yeah. for society. Yeah. Our paper has come out to say that we have gone beyond the planetary limit for mm. chemicals and for chemical pollution. Oh. The idea then is to think about how to actually limit total chemical production yeah. in the same way that we um, have come to that realization in with greenhouse gases. Yeah. yeah. So we have to stop. Yes. We have to think about how to implement limits. That's an incredibly hard, hard, challenging concept, but it's an aspiration and I will continue to work on this. I have said I have no, I, I have to work on this. Mm -hmm. I made a decision to have children mm -hmm. and hopefully they'll have yeah. their own kids. Yes. Yeah. It's my responsibility to keep working on this. What would that change if, you know, the, I'm trying to imagine the, the magnitude of saying we have to reduce the number of chemicals, we have to stop, uh, you know, give me a concrete example for people that uh, try to imagine what would it look like for their own life? I, I'm glad you, I'm glad you asked that question. So it's not, it's putting a cap yeah. on chemical production mm -hmm. that is poised to triple by 2050. Mm -hmm. So not only does chemical production consume, uh, emit greenhouse mm -hmm. gases, but the pollution involved yeah. is considerable. What does it look like? If I could just imagine a world mm -hmm. <laughs> in which we no longer use lead in paints mm -hmm. okay. that poison people today. Yeah. If I could imagine a world in which we stopped mining and using asbestos that's largely mm -hmm. used in third world countries. Yeah. So, so those are two good examples. Yes. Lead, asbestos, you know. Mercury. There are, there, there are many examples. examples. Mm -hmm. We have to continue working mm -hmm. for that. So this would not be massive without talking about food, oh. because <laughs> <laughs> Massey is about dinners, is about lunches, and it's about seeing, uh, having a conversation with somebody and sharing a meal. So what's your favorite food? So I can tell the chef. My favorite? I don't have a favorite food because I love food in general. I mean, generally, I love ice cream. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that's a good, uh, that's a good that's way a good for us. Point. That's, that's a good way for us to start. So, uh, we're hoping that you will come and, and continue to talk a, a, about your scholarship and your great work. And we want to celebrate your academic projects at Massey. That's part of be becoming a, a senior fellow is to have Massey celebrate what you do for the public good. So on this note, I want to thank you for your contribution today. Thank you. You're so very welcome and thank you. <laughs>